Now, I read Noam Chomsky years ago talking about how when he speaks in America, uh, people typically afterwards come up to him and say, oh, you, you've got me so concerned. I, I agree with you so much, but what can we do? And he says when he speaks in Central America, South America, elsewhere in the world, he says afterwards people come up and tell him what they're doing. <laughs> Um, and I would like our conversation tonight really to take off from that point. If you take this mic, talk about what you're doing or what you'd like to be doing or about ideas you have uh, uh, and, and, and bring yourself into it. So without further ado, uh, Bernadine and Bill. Thank you all so much, and thank you for having us in Utica. I think we have to amend Noam's uh, comment about speaking in America because everyone we've met in Utica tells us what they're doing, including the anti-drone activists. We, uh, we, yeah, we walked with Kathy Kelly through Iowa. We walked through Michigan uh, against drones, and I think it's one of the most powerful experiences we've had recently. And it's something that you know I often think in a world as out of balance as this world. You can dive in anywhere and make a difference. And the anti-drone people have really made public what has been a secret. So, <laughs> we, Let's set a time when we're going to ask you to jump up, okay? Yeah, well, I was going to say that, you know, our son Malik, who's now 37 years old, but when he was five, he heard me speak to a group of teachers, and afterwards he said it was pretty good but that I went on too long, and then he asked, uh, do professors get paid by the word? And I thought, wow, how does he know that? He's only five. Um, but so Oren is now charged with stopping us uh, if, we, if we go too long. I think we'll talk for 20, 25 minutes. But you're right, Oren, we would rather have a conversation than a lecture, and I think we'll all learn more from that. Um, there's wisdom, obviously, in this room. Let's unlock the wisdom in the room. I want to just say how grateful we are to all of you for being here, to Orrin and Kim for inviting us. We spent a marvelous afternoon uh, talking with the two of them and getting to know them, talking with Derek Scarlino and some of the other activists and feeling really um, home, feeling at home. Um, so thank you very much for having us and for being here. Um, I'm going to say a quick word about the, the book and then we'll go back and forth quite a bit. Um, I often think that, that those of us who are progressive, who are radical, who are, um, think of ourselves as revolutionaries, we spend a lot, we're very good at critiquing what is, and we're not always as good about saying what it is we fight for. There's a, there's a bumper sticker that I've long admired in Chicago, and the bumper sticker says, if you're not pissed off, you're not paying attention. And I think that's absolutely true. If you open your eyes for a minute, you would be furious about certain things. You would be enraged. But I want to always add a bumper sticker to that that says, if you're only pissed off, you're not going to get to the world you want to get to. And so we have to be both, we have to find a way to balance anger with love, um, furiousness with generosity. And we have to walk, dance that dialectic every day. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a dialectic that we need. It's a dialectic that keeps us going. And so... The, the, so the answer to burnout often is just finding that dialectic. How do you find a way to imagine a world that could be but is not yet and walk toward it on two legs and keep pushing toward it at the same time countering all the negativity and the backwardness and the bigotry and the, and the racism and the, and the war that, that is going on everywhere. Okay, I'm going to interrupt you for a minute. Um, Bill started off, I, I live with him. We've lived together for a long time, 45 years. Well, it feels so much. Anyway. So, much, so, much, uh, so he, he writes books, and that's great. So you can imagine that in order to produce a book like this, he started a book thinking that we would be in a very different political moment than we are right now, and that the idea of pushing the major issues of our time forward would be something that we would be doing under the her administration, you know what I'm talking about. So that was kind of our working assumption. And Bill set out to write a pamphlet. He said, I'm done with writing books, I'm going to write a pamphlet. Well, he 
couldn't stop himself. So he did write a book instead of a pamphlet, but it's a small book and it's pamphlet-like, um, trying to identify kind of the major issues of our times and having almost bumper sticker slogans for what we want and trying to push against writing the critique. It's hard not to if you've spent your lifetime in opposition and in resistance uh, to do that. But the idea was to try to push beyond the critique of what is and to foreground where we're going or where we think we're going in the hope that people would write pamphlets back at them saying you're totally wrong about this or totally wrong about that. Yeah, so let me put a parenthesis in here and tell you a word about Bernadine. We were just sitting next door with a couple of comrades, young comrades, and one of them had heard her speak at Evergreen State a few years ago, how long? A couple of years ago. And um, he remembers uh, her saying he, he, something, they were having coffee afterwards, and she said, when in doubt, escalate. So that's, so, so when, I, when, I, when I get confused, she'll escalate. I, I, um, I have to tell you a quick story about Bernadine, and then I'll come back to the. We often are trolled by right-wingers. We were talking about this a little bit uh, with Kim and, and Oren earlier. So people threaten us and write hateful stuff to us all the time. And we, we're pretty inured to it. We don't pay much attention. But last summer, I got a packet in the mail that was incredible. And I opened the packet, and in, there was all this right-wing kitsch in it about us. One was a T-shirt with a picture of me on one side and a picture of Welch's grape juice on the other side. And below the grape juice, it said, good free radical. And below me, bad free radical. So, so but there was also a bumper sticker. There was a bumper sticker in the packet. And the bumper sticker said, Bill Ayers and his wife should be in prison. So I showed it to Bernadine and she said, his wife, I have a name. Not a word about the prison. <laughs> hey, dude, I don't want to go to prison. Yeah. Anyway, that's right. <laughs> so you'll see more of her. But um, just another quick word on, on the motivation. So the idea, Bernadine says it's it's kind of bumper stickery, and it's true. So there's after a plea for unleashing our more radical imaginations and getting unstuck from the kind of arguments that are given to us in education, do we want charters or do we want vouchers? And we all want to say none of the above. You know, do we want to starve? Uh, you know, our opponents, or do we want to bomb them? The starvers or the bombers? And neither of the above. So it's an attempt to break from the, the, the debates are on offer and say something different. Let's abolish the prisons. Let's end war. Let's, you know, let's build freedom schools. Let's have universal health care. And frankly, the title comes from a, a slogan that was written all over the walls of Paris in 1968, sometimes attributed to Che Guevara, and it says, be realistic, demand the impossible. And I was very taken with the contradiction in that, that idea, because frankly, everything I write about is not only realistic, I think it's in the majority opinion in our country. And it's funny, because people think of us who don't know us, they think of us as kind of very much um, on the far left, and I suppose we are, except that I've always felt, and I still feel, that on the eight or 10 major issues of the day, I'm in the majority in this country. And if I can't persuade people, then shame on me. I haven't articulated it well, I haven't organized the movement properly and so on. But it's an attempt to say, look, here are things that most people want and need, and it's not that far-fetched, it's happening in other parts of the world, we can do it, but we must build a social movement to get there. And so that's really the, the thrust of the book. Or I would say a series of linked social movements. Yeah. I don't, you know, I'm always, I don't know what, I'm, I'm, I'm open, I'm uh, eclectic, I don't have a position about how to get from here to where we think we can be in terms of a radical social force in the United States. But I do think that we know that connecting issues and this is what Bill tries to do through writing about 10 different issues. Connecting the issues is at the heart of the matter. When we were coming up as young radicals, when I, I was in law school by the time Dr. King came to Chicago, um, and when he came to Chicago, I said to myself, this is it, if I don't find out what he's doing and hurl myself as a volunteer with what he's doing on the west side of Chicago, I'll have missed the chance of a lifetime, and I did. 
I hurled myself there as a law student, and I wore an armband that said legal. And I got recruited to be involved in a citywide rent strike, which is what Dr. King called for. And I think that that kind of impulse to make meaning and to be part of what's happening in your lifetime is just so valuable. I feel so lucky that that moment happened for me and that my law school friends, I just, just to show you how dated we are, I just had my 50th law school reunion last week. So that was 50 years ago. So now Tell him who you graduated with from the college and the law school. Many wonderful people, but he means John Ashcroft was in my law school. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't characterize my law school class. Seven women out of 100 law students. Um, and every one of the men draft eligible the day that we graduated. So it characterized their three years there. And of course, because of the draft and because of the war in Vietnam and because of the black freedom movement at that time, it meant that everyone except the seven of us women, you know, was out searching for a way really to not go to Vietnam if they could get out of it uh, in a way that was, uh, so it was an urgent time, a time of, you know, tremendous pressure and tremendous <clears throat> vitality. And two years later, because of the male-female discrimination around law school and so on, uh, suddenly there were 50% of women in law school because the draft uh, exemption ended for law schools that year because of the pressure on needing more and more troops to go to Indochina. So for me, that kind of combination of issues came together, but I think any sober look at the world today will tell us that they are together right here in Utica. They are together everywhere we go in the United States. They're certainly together in our home city. Black Lives Matter has reignited the best of the radical spirit of the civil rights movement and of the black freedom movement as it came north and across the United States and give a new urgency to our time. And the same for undocumented and unafraid, the students, young people across the country who stepped out and kind of courageously said, you know, there's no such thing as aliens. There's no such thing as people who don't belong here. And I hear from you all that Utica has a long tradition of welcoming immigrants, and including <coughs> documented and undocumented people, but fleeing oppression from all over the world and welcoming them into your community. So our, our communities have this tremendous wisdom and heritage uh, within us. And our challenge in this time, not the challenge we thought when Bill started writing the book of having a woman uh, as our president of the United States, but now uh, uh, in a way a much more urgent challenge of, of really facing naked white supremacy, of really facing naked war making, uh, unleashed war making, uh, and erratic perhaps unleashed war making, <laughs> makes us I think the possibilities of coming together around the issues we most care about is really right within our grasp. Could you say a word about the three R's in Chicago as an example? Well, there's a new coalition in Chicago um, that really we get the benefit of, although we've kind of been on the fringes of following young people for a while, is it's called the three R's, and it, it is named Resistance, Reimagine, Rebuild. And there's about 45 organizations that are in this umbrella now um, organization who've been working to come up with a common platform. Not, deta not a detailed what we should do, but a kind of like, this is what we stand for, these 10 points are what we agree about and what we stand for. And so many actions, many teach-ins, um, many educational uh, events that happen um, are now done under the name of 3R uh, if they fit into that kind of general program. So we're lucky enough to be in a community that's bubbling and seething uh, with creative activity, but also has an idea that, that the arts and humor play as big a role in what we're doing as kind of what you might think of as hardcore political work. So let me tell you another story about Bernadine. Okay, so I'm enjoying this enormously. Um, so, I don't know what he's going to say. Yeah, why would you know? Okay, so so she got drawn into the movement um, through King coming to Chicago. I was at the University of Michigan, and um, 
And I heard somebody in 1965, the president of Students for Democratic Society, we had the first teaching in Ann Arbor, and he said to this group of students, um, I was one of them, I was a, a, a sophomore at the time, and he said, you need to find a way to live your life so that it doesn't make a mockery of your values. And that became such a challenge to me, and it became a challenge that still resonates for me. How do you live your life in a way that it doesn't make a mockery of your values? It assumes that you have values, it assumes that you can find a way to link your values to your lived experience, it assumes that the personal is political, and that question has just driven me for 50 years uh, ever since. But I want to tell you one more story about Bernadine, and then I'll come back to this, um, which is that uh, J. Edgar Hoover, when he was the head of his criminal enterprise in the 20s, you know, when they started the FBI, and he was the first and longest serving FBI director, now the FBI's back in the news, and somehow we're supposed to shed tears or, or somehow think about the integrity of the FBI, and my mind kind of breaks down. Um, so J. Edgar Hoover was the founding director of this political police, the criminal enterprise, and in 1923, I believe, he called the great social reformer, activist, radical Jane Addams, another wonderful woman from Chicago, he called her the most dangerous woman in America. And 50 years later, still the head of his criminal enterprise, he called Bernadine Dorn the most dangerous woman in America. And it was the only time I ever agreed with J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> I was absolutely right. Um, back to the question, though, of what is to be done. I think, I think that we, we all need, I think Bernadine's point about unity and finding the common threads so that we link war and warming. We link white supremacy with conquest abroad. We understand the ways in which the, the, the city of Chicago, for example, is broke on purpose when it comes to funding public education. It's not a natural phenomenon. It's a, it's a structured reality that drives people out of the public schools who can get out and leaves the most vulnerable kids subject to a racist, you know, um, you know um, kind of, torture chamber, I won't go further. But, but so I think we have to link the issues, but I also think there is a rhythm to activism that we should always keep in our minds. There's no recipe for it, but there is a rhythm and it involves in my mind four things <clears throat> that we all have to do. And the first, on the, uh, the first thing is we have to open our eyes and pay attention. Not once, but every day, every day as History is unfolding as the world, the complex world is, um, is changing. We have to open our eyes and pay attention. If we don't pay attention, we can't act sensibly. We can't be good citizens, good residents, or moral people. I, I often, you know, I think the kind of intentional blindness, the intentional fake innocence is one of the great crimes that we have to overcome. I think of my beloved mother, who I was taking care of 20 years ago. She had broken her, no, 30 years ago, she had broken her ankle. And I was out in her suburban palace taking care of her. And she said to me, innocently enough, what is this thing I've heard of called global warming? And it was 30 years ago, so it wasn't as well known as it is now. But I didn't want to scare the shit out of her. So I said very quietly, you know, well, I explained very quietly about catastrophic climate change. And she looked at me angrily and said, well, I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> right, because you asked, now you might have to know. And if you know, then you might have to take the second step. And the second step is to be astonished. Astonished at the beauty and the ecstasy that is everywhere around us. And astonished at the unnecessary suffering that human beings visit upon one another. And that capitalism visits upon us and that empire visits upon us and that white supremacy visits upon us. We have to be, again, <coughs> astonished at the beauty and astonished at the pain. And then the third thing is you have to do something, something. You have to rise up in some way. And the fourth step is you have to rethink. If you don't rethink or you don't doubt that your action was all that it should have been, you get stuck in dogma. And frankly, in our own view of our, of our history, there was that time in 1969, 1970, that we were stuck in a self-righteous, dogmatic tailspin. And because we couldn't rethink, we couldn't move forward. It's essential that you open your eyes, be astonished, act, doubt, repeat. And you keep doing that every day. And that's how you build a lifetime of activism. 
And as you can imagine, easy to say, hard right. to do. Exactly. Because when by 1969, I think it's fair to say that we, I was, I'll just speak for myself, I was in a rage every single day. 7,000? Is it 7,000? 6,000. 6,000 people a week being killed in Vietnam or Indochina. Lied to constantly, hour after hour after hour, through the TV and through the news media about what was happening there. But by then, our vision of, of the uh, absolute despicable nature and imperial nature of the Vietnam War was sharpened. And we read a lot of Vietnamese history, and we read a lot of Vietnamese poetry, and we ate Vietnamese food, and we had maps on our walls about the war in Vietnam, and we listened to vets coming back from Vietnam, and we became furious about stopping it. And I, I think that, you know, otherwise, if you don't have that as part of this history, it sounds easy to say, to go with what yeah. Bill said about the rhythm of activism. But we were in a rage at the complicity and the silence of people around us. And I think we have to keep that in mind because the closer you look, you know, it's disturbing. It's deeply disturbing. And once you throw yourself into being active, it's easy, to, it's easy still for me to see and recognize how the temptation of dogma and the insistence that you have a truth that nobody else has, which is highly unlikely and not true. So I think that, that um, I just wanted to add how seductive the path is when you discover something um, and see how profound it is. So just to go back to a little personal story, when I volunteered to go join Dr. King's forces on the west side, this was people my age who had been in the south with Dr. King, who had been arrested many times, and who were, you know, very deeply involved in building mass struggles. And they knew so much more than I knew. And I was, you know, completely swept away by, by wanting to be like them and wanting to do like them. And, I, and he asked us to identify slumlords, um, the major slumlords in Chicago. And I went back with my law student friends and we spent two weeks frantically trying to decode the holding companies and the blind trusts in with which property on the west side of Chicago was held at this time, a long time ago, but still true. Uh, and we couldn't identify the most prominent slumlords who owned this housing and who were gouging people with substandard housing on the side of Chicago. And so we crept back, <clears throat> totally embarrassed, hoping that maybe Dr. King wouldn't remember and the people around him wouldn't remember the assignment that he'd given us. And as soon as he saw us, he said, what did you find? And I said, we couldn't, we couldn't come through the maze of holdings. And it was impossible. But Billy said, never mind, we'll do a citywide rent strike. And it was like that. It was just that kind of time where, OK, that was a good idea. We don't have that. We're going to do a citywide rent strike. And it ignited people night after night to go into a building and, and I just watched. And what did they do? What did these experienced organizers do? They'd leaflet a building, show up that night, and people would describe what was wrong with their building, what was substandard about the building in great detail, you know, leaking roofs and no locked doors and broken windows and no heat in the winter. But they would make a list. And then they would say, well, here's a strategy. And they'd look at me, the white girl in the room with the legal armband. And I would say, well, if you put your rent into escrow accounts that we can help you set up, you can use that money and you can decide how to fix your building. And that's what the law says. And we'll prevent you from being evicted. And it was astonishing. And people wanted to do it. And it was a strategy that said the people with the problems are the people with the solutions. That was my deepest yeah. lesson yeah. Uh, from those days of struggle. The people with the problems are the people with the solutions. And so it allowed us, the big movement, social movement of the time, to build a citywide rent strike, to have groups of lawyers and law students downtown in the one landlord tenant court where people were being evicted every 42 seconds, um, typically, and to come in with, you know, reams of paper and prevent there from being evictions when there was substandard housing and people had put their rent in escrow. So it was an astonishing strategy, but it was part of a big movement for racial justice and for equity and for fairness. 
as well as a concrete strategy for people with the problems. Yeah, so one more story about Bernadine, and then, because I like telling stories about Bernadine. I don't know and what then, he's going to say. Uh, no, of course not. How would you know? And then I want you to talk to us and talk back to us, and we'll get into a dialogue. So you don't have to go like this, or because I'm cutting. But uh, it, just in regard to this, um, so one of the things that happened in those days was that the, the Cook County police sheriffs would come along and take people's belongings out of their apartment as part of the eviction. And just like in the 30s when the Communist Party did this, the civil rights folks, the black freedom folks, would gather and take the furniture back in. And it was a wonderful kind of direct action. It was an example of what we were talking about earlier about sanctuary as a metaphor, not as a, you know, not as a legalistic term, but you know, it was protecting people. It was the, the movement standing on the side of, of, of folks and being shoulder to shoulder with them. And one day um, on the south side of Chicago in Woodlawn, they had taken the furnishings out of an apartment and here was a family evicted with children and the movement had gathered to take things back in and Bernadine was standing there as a legal observer and she felt somebody right to her left and he tapped her on the shoulder and said, hold this and handed it, uh, his sports coat to her, and she turned around, it was Muhammad Ali, and he picked up a sofa and carried it back into the apartment. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a wonderful moment, and Ali was part of it, and it was just a, an amazing movement. But okay, I'm gonna stop there, because I want you to join in with us. <coughs> okay? One more thing. You know, in the, and just another example, a contemporary example for me, because I was teaching when this was happening, was watching uh, the queer movement change all of our minds and hearts, and, and take over a territory that we didn't even know was there. I was teaching human rights at Northwestern Law School. I thought I was contemporary with social issues of our time, but I remember the year in which I realized that my students, 100% of them conservative, liberal, radical, my students all were in solidarity with gay rights, with queer rights with, you know, upending gender as we understood it. And it, that's because that was a social movement that included, I think, such brilliant strategies and ideas about, you know, coming out, speaking out, coming out to your family, that by that period of time in the United States history, everybody knew somebody or knew of somebody one step away who was gay and who'd come out. And you could look back into your own family history and think, oh my God, and Sarah, of course. You know, but, it, but it, it had that kind of personal and global reach, the way the movement spilled out, that changed hearts and minds. And I think that can be true for us around war and peace, <coughs> around the issues that seem the most difficult, prison, you know, the prison, massive prison system that we have. And, and I think Bill's book takes us there to where speaking out about what is obvious and talking from experience and leaning on the people who have the closest experience and the most to suffer makes it really possible. You know, these are both examples of history surprising us. And in many ways, I think we have to remind ourselves that history has surprised us time and time again. And history can surprise us again. And we can be the agents of that surprise. That's what I live for. That's what I hope we all can accomplish together. So thank you very much, Oren. You're right. I'm going to start with myself. <laughs> I, I just want to add to what they said that um, I, 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 there was some point early uh, on when uh, I think Bill was going through the points of becoming aware, being astonished, uh, and, and, and acting, and so forth. That. The type of um, activism I think this whole for right now, the type of resistance, goes against kind of uh, the liberal um, aversion we have to suffering, to sacrifice. And I think that, I mean, the secret is that when one is willing, when, when one sees that something has to be done, and when one is willing to sacrifice for that, it's actually not a deprivation. It actually, uh, it, that, that living according to your values, it, it, and that almost always entails some kind of sacrifice in this culture, 
actually feeds your energy and, 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 and makes your life happier. Uh, so that's just the word for sacrifice here. I, I, uh, but uh, do we have questions, comments, anything? Chris, yeah. do you want to take the uh, oh, poster? Sure. You, want I can to hear. you can hear you can yell. Now that we can hear you, go ahead. Hello, Chris. Go okay. ahead. Well, anyway, first of all, um, yeah, I'm pretty loud. Um, it, it's just so exciting and a pleasure, uh, Bill and Bernadette. Um, I've read about your lives. And some of the, I haven't read the book yet. I'll, I'll try to be quick and very long-winded. But, um, and I hate to ask like a tough question right off the outset, um, but a concern that I have, um, I'm a longtime activist <clears throat> involved with the Green Party and some local activist groups here in Utica, has been kind of a developing affinity among some el elements of the left and the Antifa, parts of the Antifa movement <clears throat> for feeling there's a need to get physical at times. You know, a punch a Nazi gift, you guys might have seen that online. It just went over and over and over again. Um, and I'm kind of a, a contradiction in terms because on the one hand, I mean, I'm a green and I'm committed to nonviolence, and yet historically, I believe you said you, history surprises. So I think there are sometimes revolutionary movements that obviously use violence in order to overturn greater violence. So I am not someone who believes in an ethical absolute of nonviolence at all. But my concern is in the United States, I believe that any, pretty much, I'm not necessarily talking about property, just at all property destruction, but any embrace of violence or promoting it or saying, you know, we need to get physical, whatever, I think, to me, can be really counterproductive and even lethal uh, on the left. And, I, and, I, and you talk about the rage issue, and um, that evolution that you guys went through. And I, and I realize it's a loaded question, given the past, I don't want to go on, but I just wanted to know, to hear yeah. both of what you think, because I just see more and more of a, a willingness to sort of, let's get out there, and if we need to fight. And, I, and I'm one who believes that if, if right-wing, you know, fascist speech yelling fire in a theater, et cetera, I'm not at all opposed to shutting that down. But my concern is beyond that, there seems to be more, like we're ready to get out there and mix it up. So I just want to hear what you guys think about that. Well, uh, it is difficult. It's complicated and long. It's a long, complicated question. But I, but I think I just have a couple of thoughts. One is that I think that, that one of the genius moves of the Black Freedom Movement, both in the 50s and 60s and today, is that it, it exposes the violence that's there. There is structural violence on the ground. And, you know, often people act as if violence is a question of faith. Do you believe in it or you don't believe right. in it? I'm a huge fan of direct act, nonviolent direct action. Right. It's always worth remembering that King said nonviolent direct, direct action. action. He didn't say sit on your couch and exactly. smoke a joint. Nothing wrong with that, but it's not the same thing. <laughs> right. You have to do something. And when you do something, and King was a genius at this, you expose the violence that's mm -hmm. already there in the system. Right. Mm -hmm. When you live in a slave state, just to take an obvious example from our history, that is a violent state. Whether anyone rises up, whether anyone does anything, whether everybody lives in peace next to each other, the violence is inherent in the situation. When Nat Turner rises up, uh, when Harriet Tubman frees people, then, then they're accused of the violence, but actually the violence is in the social situation. Yeah. So that's important. In terms of punching a Nazi, um, which I don't know, Bernadine. I didn't even know it was. A, I didn't know it was a thing, <laughs> but it's a thing. Okay, the, the, I'll go back to my four, the very complicated but very simple to state four steps of activism: pay attention, be astonished, act, doubt. When you act and then you doubt or you rethink, the the standard by which you judge whether you were effective or not in your action is a pedagogical standard. You don't always know it a priori, you don't know it in advance, but the question is, did you teach and did you learn? If you taught and you learned, then there's something to recommend the action you took. But if your standard is, didn't I look great on the front page of the paper with my mask on throwing that Molotov cocktail? That's a bad standard. That's not the standard you should adhere to. You should say, did what we did, by picketing, by boycotting, by walking out, by sitting in, whatever the tactics, did they teach and did they learn? If so, we're going forward. If not, we're changing direction.
So I'll give you, you know, an example. You will agree about immediately, and then I'll try to get make it more complicated. Yeah. So when Occupy happened, right. right, it 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 was so brilliant in so many ways, right? Occupy Wall Street, and then it got replicated across the country very rapidly. I don't know what happened here, but I can tell you in Chicago, weirdly enough, rather than having a space. There was a street corner. It was really a crossroads, and there was never exactly a space. But Bill and I were traveling a lot in those times, so we went to many Occupy sites, and they were brilliantly specific. They were local. The one in Detroit was almost a homeless shelter. It was open all night, and there was food all night, and there was sleeping bags and blankets and warm clothes. And it happened, boom, like that. And it was different than... Boston, which was a library, kind of, you know, a so whole Boston. library in very Boston. And, yeah. But yeah. Every, everybody had their own kind of aspect, right? There was a, a general strike in Oakland. So it had, it had, it, it was adaptable, it was flexible, it was focused it was on, yeah. on, on uh, you know, the, the super rich <laughs> and all of the rest of us, the 1%, the 99%. Brilliant. It's just brilliant when you stop right. and think about it. And yet, right away from day one, there were the people who were wagging their fingers at the brilliant people who did Occupy. Where's the program? And where's the organization? And what's going to happen? And I think that happens to every kind of inventive, creative wave that we have. And it, it's infuriating in a way, and it's you know usually right to overlook it and not take it too seriously and to go forward with your work because... The invention was so malleable and creative, and it took us a long way forward to say mainly 99% of us are on the same side, even within the United States, and 1% are getting are laughing all the way to the bank here. So that always strikes me as just a good example and something I think that that uh, the movements of Black Lives and the movement the uh, Vietnam, the uh, Iraqi vets against the war, and lots of other people since then have learned from and taken advantage of. Yeah, and one, I mean, this is a clear example, Occupy, but there are thousands of examples. Every example of a revolutionary or a radical move, the day before it happened, it was impossible, and the day after, it was inevitable. If they called us the day before they pitched tents in Wall Street and said, we're going to pitch tents in Wall Street, we would have said, what, why? And the day after, we showed up. Because that's the way it is. The day before Rosa Parks sat in, that wasn't possible. The day after, it just seems inevitable. I just remembered the name of that <coughs> book I was trying to talk about earlier with the Albany Free School. It was making it up as we go along. That's right. And that's, and that's, that's kind of relevant here, too. And there's always that kind of aspect of that's it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Maybe you take the here, mic. Here, 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 here. This isn't about action, but it's just something I've been thinking about. The, you know, we've been observing this slow disintegration of Chicago, and I just wonder what what has happened with Rahm Emanuel and, and Chicago. He was the president's man. He was the chief of staff in the White House, Mr. Badass. He goes back, he gets elected mayor, and seems to be completely ineffectual. And I just. Uh, why is that? Why is the the city seemingly going downhill? Well, uh, okay, you know, Ron Emanuel is not our friend. He, if he had had to run for re-election a year ago or two years ago, he would have been overwhelmingly defeated because he was covering up, you know, for a police force that had targeted violence in the black community. And it, it is unbelievable. And he, it, if you look at the police contract in the city of Chicago, negotiated and, and approved by the city and the city council, you will see what it did. Now they've just had to do a new contract because the murder of Laquan McDonald blew up on them and lots of organizers and activists, including Black Lives Matter at the lead of it, um, you know, took them to court, demanded the autopsy, put the lie to the police story, put the lie to the mayor's story, and really discredited the state's attorney, threw out a state's attorney who's locally elected that never happens in Chicago. I don't see Chicago as, you know, the, uh, the way that it's characterized by the right wing, 
daily in the newspapers and by the president as a dysfunctional city. There is a section of the black community of Chicago in which sh shootings, young people have guns, like young people have access to high caliber guns, primarily in a very distinct 17 precincts on the south side of Chicago. And there, there is absolute staggering numbers of killings within that community. That's allowed to happen. That's allowed to happen because gun, they're not making, these kids are not making guns in their community. They're buying them from where? From Indiana. They're buying them because they're trucked into Chicago and sold for $100 on the south side of Chicago. So it's very specific to that neighborhood. And most of Chicago wouldn't recognize the characterization of Chicago as Mayhem City at all because it's so concentrated right there. And in my opinion, this is, uh, it, it really would have, um, would have sent Rahm Emanuel out. And there's a tremendous political struggle going on about what kind of policing makes our city safe and what kind of policing is legitimate. You know, the other thing I would say, two, two things quickly. One is that if you're interested in Chicago and you want to see the other side of the kind of national narrative, there's a brilliant book by our young friend Kevin Koval, a poet, spoken word artist, um, and, and, um, founder of and founder of Louder Than a Bomb, the teen poetry slam, and a teacher. And Kevin wrote a book that Haymarket just published, which, who also published this book. And the book is called The People's History of Chicago. And it's 77 poems about Chicago, and it is absolutely breathtaking. So that, to me, is the antidote. But Bernadine talks about police violence and this, and this corridor uh, in which police violence and, and other violence goes on. And I think you have to map over that, and you can do this throughout the country. There's a geography project involved, and that is you can map the shootings in Chicago, and you can see that those are places that have 60% unemployment a young, among young men. Those are places where Rahm Emanuel closed the schools. Those are places where Rahm Emanuel closed the mental health clinics the drug treatment clinics, and that's what's happening. So it's not, it's not a natural phenomenon. We say in Chicago the schools are broke on purpose. Mental health is broke on purpose. And it's a certain population that's suffering. Chicago is a tale of three cities. There's black Chicago, Latino Chicago, and, and white Chicago, and those are, the, they're about a third, a third, a third. And you look at where the social services, where the schools, where the transportation has broken down, it's in the oppressed communities, and I think it's something we have to fight. I just want to say one more word about it. That's why the 3R coalition that's been built includes rebuild at the end, because it's not Hyde Park where the University of Chicago is and where we live that needs to be rebuilt. It's, it's these <coughs> communities, these really impoverished communities in the immigrant communities on the south side of Chicago that need to be rebuilt. But that's the R of it, you know, reinvest, rebuild is part of reimagining. Uh, we're talking about Rahm Emanuel, who's a Democrat, and I guess I'd like to bring Trump into the discussion. In my mind, we're, we're kind of making Rahm Emanuel be the bad guy, but this is unfortunately much bigger than Rahm Emanuel. He represents lots of people and not just right-wingers and Republicans. And so, okay, he may be a bad guy, but he is not the bad guy. No, you're right. Well, let me, let me just say that, yeah, there's no sense personalizing what's going on. It's much deeper than that. So we had an election in November, and we saw a, a neoliberal, you know, uh, some think a warmongering um, Democrat running against a guy who ran a fascist campaign. I don't think he's consolidated a fascist government, but he ran a fascist campaign by any definition. So that was the choice, and it was a, a horrible choice. One of the problems now, and one of the challenges now, first of all, haven't you been astonished, and you, many of you participated, in the kind of spontaneous resistance that grew up uh, in, the, in the wake of Donald Trump's election? It's been breathtaking. We were going to Washington to be part of a peace demonstration we organized it last summer. We imagined Hillary in the White House, us with our peace signs. Oh, I wish, you know, it would have been just normal. Um, and then we went, we had our peace ball the night before the inauguration. Bernadine and I got tickets to go to the inauguration because 
our congressman couldn't give them away, so we got 10 tickets and gave eight to Code Pink, and we went in. And so we were two of the million and a half people that Donald Trump thought he saw. <laughs> we were actually there. And, uh, and, and Bernadine held this giant banner, say no to racism, say no to Islamophobia, and we engaged in conversation for three and a half hours. It was breathtaking, and I loved every minute of it because we were threatened twice, but mostly not, and some people recognize this. Definitely, this mostly not. I mean, mostly many people, not. who I was at one of the big entrance uh, exits where people were leaving, and I would say more than a third, maybe almost a half people, looked at my sign and said, I agree with that. Yeah. Meaning, I don't, probably don't agree with you, but I agree with that, yeah. that yeah. idea. And I think that's a good example of not caricaturing who's in front of you or... And, and, out who's and I think way too much energy is spent trying to figure out who voted for him, and, and a lot of the analysis is just way off. But we've seen then we so we participated in that, and we're big believers that the that the essence of democracy is talking to strangers, and that's what we did. We talked to strangers. Several people were famous. You don't know this, but we're famous on the right wing websites because we're examples of everything that's wrong with America. And so a lot of people wanted to take selfies with us, you know, when a guy came up to me and said, my friends in Dallas won't believe that I got this close to a communist, you know. It was wonderful. Um, but, so after that, we went to the Women's March, as many of you did, either in D.C. or here or somewhere. Uh, um, where were you guys? Seneca? Paul? Oh, yeah. So... It was extremely exciting. And then the airport demonstration. The, the Women's March, of course, everybody has a story. My favorite, because I'm an old early childhood teacher, was a big banner that some early childhood teachers were carrying. It had a picture of Sam I Am from Green Eggs and Ham. And it said, don't put your hand up my skirt. Don't put your hand down my shirt. Don't put your hand near my rump. I do not like you, Donald Trump. <laughs> now, that's creative and spontaneous. And just as Bernadine said earlier about Occupy, the immediate chorus of commentators, they don't have a program. Where's the leadership? Who can I interview? Mm -hmm. Get over it. You know, it was a spontaneous, brilliant, incredibly exciting yeah. moment. And then, do you think that's going to fade and the airport demonstrations right. happen? And suddenly we're in a different world. And the Democrats, this is where I come back to the Democratic Party, they're scrambling to catch up with the resistance on the ground. And they're, ch they're scrambling to channel it into a bipartisan, a two-party kind of answer. That's not the answer. And the reason it's not, and the reason they have no credibility in leading the resistance is because for four decades, there's been a bipartisan kind of effort that's led us to permanent war, mass incarceration, the, destruct the destruction of the public square, including <coughs> public education, selling everything to Wall Street, the kind of you know, wealth gap widening. So our job isn't to get kind of tooled into something that already exists. It's to figure out new ways in Utica, in Chicago, to build a 3R kind of movement where we can kind of be independent and at the same time participate in real politics. And I think that's, that's my overall response to kind of the, the notion of what's happening. I couldn't be both more terrified and more excited about the political moment we live in. And I think it's up to us to make the terrified part disappear and make the excitement and the optimism uh, pour forward. More, more comments, more questions. By the way, that's what we try to do here. You know, yeah. it's, 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 it's the very thing he's describing, is, is to keep a dialogue going, to keep our imaginations going, and to be creating a different reality here on the ground. It's, it, it's really essential that we make the world we want, you know. Uh, anyhow, hey, more you people. Know, or, 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 you know, so, you know, or you remind me, because we were talking about this earlier, that I'm often accused of being a romantic or being utopian. Um, I, sometimes I'm accused of being optimistic, which I'm not at all, because an optimist like a pessimist knows what's coming. I have no idea what's coming. That makes me hopeful because if I knew what was coming, I might jump off a bridge or go to sleep. But I don't know what's coming. So, But, but I'm accused of being utopian. And I, I remember a friend who was also accused of being utopian. And, the, and the, the person who made the accusation said, you know, 
you, you're just too utopian and it's not realistic and we can't do what you're describing. And the response is, you know, well, it's true. I take two steps towards utopia and utopia walks two steps away. If I run 10 steps towards utopia, utopia walks 10 steps away. And so, yeah, what's the point of utopia, of being utopian? And the answer is, it's good for walking. <laughs> yes, or Pete, uh, you want to come and use the mic? I just wanted to give an example of something that's happening here in Utica that is open to everyone in the room. And I'd like to introduce Patrick Johnson. Will you raise your hand? Who are, if you don't know Patrick Johnson, you should get to know him. Um, and he's offering many um, really, really excellent racism workshops. Um, I've attended several, and I know a lot of some other people here have too. They're free. They're at the Utica Public Library, and there has been police officers, Utica police officers in attendance, um, state troopers in attendance, probation officers, and then just at general public, um, anybody, anybody can come. And it's an open discussion. Um, black people, white people come to a room and talk about racism, talk about what their questions are, curiosities, experiences. Um, some people tell stories from their past. Some people tell a story from yesterday. And it's just an open discussion. So I recommend that everyone here attends at some point. Um, there is one tomorrow, just so happens, from 9 o'clock till three o'clock, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Lunch is part of the deal. And I have a sign up. So, um, you don't, you're not, if you sign this, you're not signing up for tomorrow. It's just that you'll, it's name and email and we can email you if there's the next workshop, workshop where it is, what the time is. And if, if you're available that day, you can come. So I hope you do come because they're very, very worthwhile. Um, I think that we could all, I know for a fact actually, that we could all benefit from talking about racism because white people don't do that very often and it's, um, and it's a plague here in Utica and the United States. So this is going to be going around. I hope you will sign up. Thank you. Yeah, man. Thanks, man. I would simply add to that that Kim and I have been to one of Patrick's workshops and Patrick is a really fine facilitator. Uh, they're very, very worthwhile. I highly recommend it. We probably would have been to another couple if we could find any time to do anything. But anyhow, uh, I, I highly recommend those. Other comments? Let's yeah, do more comments? One, or two, one or two more. What, what can the 99% that don't hold the purse strings do to encourage people in the 1% to get the economy going? We've heard it from both parties since time immemorial, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. That's why we have inner cities. Why do we have inner cities that are under the bootstraps of people? You know, I, I, I appreciate what you're asking, and I'm not sure that I that I can that I can adequately answer it. Partly because I'm not sure that. Um, <clears throat> that appealing to the better angels of the wealthy is exactly gonna get us anywhere. I mean, we have, we have a system that's rigged against the majority, that's rigged in favor of um, the wealthy, our tax code, everything about it. You know, when you look at something like the beneficence of, of uh, Mark Zuckerberg or the beneficence of Bill Gates, and the question I always have is, something's wrong with our tax code that Bill Gates can name himself yeah. superintendent of United States schools and, uh, and, and world head of health. I mean, there's something wrong with our tax code to allow that to happen. I'll tell you what I do think, though, and, I, and I, think, I think it's important that in a world as out of balance as this one is, each of us can find a place to dive in in a project of repair. When we dive into the space we dive into, we should try to connect to other people who dived in in a project of repair. That's Bernadine's first point and larger point about making those connections. But the one thing I am certain of is that if you take even a casual glance at history, whether it's the last 10 years or going way back, it's never 
the good intentions of the powerful that leads to real social change. Lyndon Johnson passed the most far-reaching social uh, civil rights legislation since Reconstruction. He was not part of the black freedom movement. He was responding to fire from below. Franklin Roosevelt was a patrician from the Hudson Valley, responding to the labor movement. And I think the most interesting example in some ways is Abraham Lincoln, who not only never joined an abolitionist party, but if you read his first inaugural address, which you haven't read because it's not in the history books, it's an absolute bowing down and kissing the ass of the slave owners. That's what he did in the first inaugural address. Three years later comes the Emancipation Proclamation. And the second inaugural address, which is the one you've read in your history books, that inaugural address could have been written by Frederick Douglass. You know Frederick Douglass, <laughs> Donald Trump's friend. Um, <laughs> The point, is, the point is that the abolitionist movement never let up. I urge you to read that history because not letting up is what led to um, the, the eventual uh, liberation and abolition of slavery. I often read history books, being an educator, longtime teacher, I, I really am annoyed by the history books that say, the 1954 Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Board of Education, unleashed decades of activism. That's right on its head. Decades of activism led to the Brown versus Board of Education decision. It couldn't be otherwise. You think nine justices just sat down one day and said, damn, white supremacy sucks and Blessing versus Ferguson was wrong. It didn't happen like that. It happened because of social struggle from below. So I think we spend too much time staring at the sites of power we have no real access to, whether it's the White House or the medieval auction block called the Congress, and, and wishing that some savior would come along. Let's, let it be Barack, let it be Bernie, rather than saying we ourselves are the people That's that right. make a difference. We ourselves, mobilized, can change the minds of people in power, but we can't do it if we're not mobilized. And so my advice is let's pay attention to the workplace, the street, the community, the classroom, the house of worship. These are sites of power that we have access to. Why whine about the sites of power we don't have access to when we're not mobilizing the sites we do have access to? And there's a great book, I just want to say, Regulating the Poor by Francis Fox, Vivid and Cloward, documenting exactly what you're saying book. about social welfare being dispersed in the United States on the basis of social unrest. That's yeah, and everybody here who's traveled to spend time in Canada or in Europe, anybody has spent time there? I mean, it's astonishing. I don't want to glorify their situations. It's always being threatened and under erosion. These are basic, you know, human rights that people, I've been teaching for, how long, 17 years, for a few weeks a year in the Netherlands. I mean, I'm almost like floored. Four day work, work weeks for everybody, four day work weeks. Free universal childcare, high quality in your neighborhood. Walk your kids there, starting at one or one and a half years old. Paid parental leave, these are not complicated things. This is what everybody wants in addition to universal health care. It goes with universal health care. You want to live a life that's rooted with your family and in your neighborhoods, and you want to live a life where you're not working 70-hour, 80-hour, seven days a week work weeks. It's insane. It's an insane thing that's taken hold here. And we're all doing it. You know, We don't turn off our cell phones. We don't go home. In the Netherlands still to this day, you know, there's these beautiful open-air markets all the time, and they close on Saturday at 2 o'clock, and they don't, and stores all close through Saturday, Sunday, until noon or 2 o'clock on Monday. They're closed, because the idea is, now the internet eroded it, I'm not totally glorifying it, that you're with your family, that you're with your friends, that you're home that you're doing different things than working around the clock. And I think that notion, we have to kind of re-examine the dilemma between jobs where we don't have, we have less and less jobs, and work. Plenty of work to be done, less and less jobs to be had. And so we really have to break apart that notion that, you know, between work and jobs and rethink how we want to live and how we all want to live. I mean, we don't all live the same and young people live differently and so on. But I think that, that these things are really intertwined and we can't give it up. We have to think it through and stand on principle for these things. 
one more we're going to do. And I would, uh, I think we got time for, we're, we're still doing pretty good. What time is it? We've got 10 minutes till 9. Till 9. We started a little late, so we could even go a little bit beyond that. But anyhow, I, 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 I just add to, okay. <laughs> I would just add to that answer that I, I think that we have to stop thinking about capitalism is, is, is like the best system that's ever been invented and nobody invented anything better and start thinking about something better. Bernadina Bill, thank you for coming thank you. Uh, to Utica. Uh, uh, maybe a different question. Um, political activism resistance is notoriously bad for interpersonal relationships uh, and marriages and family life. And I'm, and I'm very curious if, it, if it's not too intrusive um, can I ask the role that your shared bond has played in, in your life of, of, uh, of resistance and also advice you might give for others? Uh, I have a simple answer, and it's so simple, but I, I still think it's true. I mean, he keeps me laughing. I don't know. I think humor, we underestimate the role of humor and... and uh, in in relationships and in long term relationships and in families and committed relationships because you you know we I mean we argue we debate we you know criticize each other after we speak we do a lot of things but the bond of you know certainly of having a family together the most creative thing we ever did and of of uh, being part of the struggle and being determined to be part of the struggle. Not the same when you have little kids, you know, just in a lifetime, different, up and down. But nonetheless, I think that there's something there where, um, you know, I, I think movement life sometimes reduces us to, uh, to drudgery and to not insisting on doing the things we love to do. You know, sports. I mean, this weekend I got to go with three of my family members to Wrigley Field. <laughs> I mean, it's an obsession. It's ridiculous. I, the movement would make fun of it. I'm a lifelong Cubs fan. I've never been happier than I've been in the last year. I mean, you know, so, it, but whether that's, you know, dance or exercise or, or uh, you know, habit or Bill writing at the dining room table every day, Whatever it is, it's a series of, of putting together a life, but it has to have in it, you know, a range of activity and, and room to grow. Lots of room to grow. Okay. Uh, you know what I, said? I, I have a couple more people back there. I've sort of been promising I'd get to them. So okay, could let's we, do could it. We just it get, is hot. Let's, yeah, it is hot. And, and, like and it's hotter up there where I you're like sitting. Okay. I like the thing about something so he makes me laugh. I immediately thought that was a physical thing, like I didn't well. you, know, you all thought it was metaphoric, but I thought. Uh, I guess I had uh, uh, just two questions. And the first is um, I mean, both of you were part of the largest and I think uh, most exciting uh, student movement that's ever existed uh, in, in U.S. history. Um, you know, Students for a Democratic Society, you're also both in the Weather Underground. Um, and I was hoping you could share with us, um, you know, some of the, I, I guess, the major lessons that you've learned from your experience from being involved, uh, you know, with one, that mass movement, and, and also, you know, the smaller organization, which was uh, the Weather Underground. Uh, both uh, successes, um, if, you know, if we could use that word, and also uh, mistakes. That's the first question. The second question is, um, yeah. yeah, there's probably a few questions in that. It's, it's just a quick question. Um, um, but I was also hoping both of you could share with us, um, you know, um, I guess some social movements and liberation movements or revolutions uh, in your lifetimes that have had a major impact on, on your worldviews. Can we take oh, that's a yeah. lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're going to do with these, but whoops. Right. Well, I guess first of all, I mean, I mean, first of all, I think that it's worth noting, you know, the '60s is a romanticized notion. 
There is no such thing as the 60s. I don't know anybody who looked at their watch on December 31st, 1969 and said, oh shit, it's about to end. Let's get laid or whatever. Nobody said that. Um, the mic's not working. Well, the mic's not working. But they didn't the mic's not working. Oh, the mic. Just just made for you. Yes, thank you very much. Sorry. Okay, so I'm saying, the 60s is myth and simple, and it's sold back to us as a product. There's no such thing. So I think that one of the things that, that the myth of the 60s does is it allows old people to kind of bask in nostalgia for a ship that already left the shore, and that couldn't be more boring, and it allows young people to feel like, well, that was the magic moment when everything happened. In reality, we failed much more than we, in, in than we succeeded. We failed constantly. And the, the slogan that should motivate us is, fail often, fail better. Oh. You should fail better the next time, <laughs> rather than, rather than uh, wallow in your failure. So we wanted to end a war, the war in Vietnam. And as the movement deepened, we wanted to end all war. We wanted to end the cause of war. Did we succeed? We did not. The Vietnam War dragged on for 10 years, seven years after a majority of Americans opposed it. 6,000 people a week being slaughtered in our name, and a majority of Americans opposed it. That was a crisis for democracy and a crisis for the movement. And in my own family, one of my brothers went to Canada with the Great Migration, one went to the factories to organize the industrial working class, one went to the Democratic Party, one went to the communes, and I organized, with Bernadine and many others, I organized a clandestine movement that could survive what we thought of was an impending American fascism, mm -hmm. and we wanted to create a campaign of sabotage against war. Now, was it nuts? Was it crazy? Not really. Was it effective? Not exactly. Could it succeed? No, it did not. The war did not end until the, but neither did my brother who goes, went into the Democratic Party end the war. So I think there's well, a I lot. I just want to say one word. Yeah, sure. Just note the fact that this is really missing from the American history, I think. The Vietnamese won the war, not only politically, but militarily. Yes. And they drove the Americans, and this is just, you know, talk about rewriting history. They drove the Americans yeah. into the embassy and up into the helicopters, yeah. right? Yeah. Militarily yeah. broke through and took back and unified their country. Plenty wrong with what happened after that. We had romanticized it beyond imagination. But I think that's an important thing to say. And, and we were part of a big history of national liberation movements around the country and around the world. I just want to give an example right now, because it isn't mainstream, or it certainly isn't in the New York Times front page, but let's just talk about Palestine for a minute, because there is a hunger strike going on right. of Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons right now. And it's, you know, it's not getting covered, but it's an extraordinary situation because it is a colonial situation. It's an occupation of other people's land that is ongoing. It's happening in front of our eyes, and it's happening with US, US tax dollars, largely, and US military support. So I, I just feel like there's things that we have to do that aren't necessarily right under our nose that we have to add to our kind of every day, I'm going to say this, I'm going to tell people, I'm going to talk about the hunger strike there, and I'm going to do something, and whether it's sending money or speaking about it or sending support, that you have to do because it's a, a moral crisis of our time, and it's part of national liberation. And in some ways, I mean, back to your question, but in link to what Bernie's saying, when we were um, kids, and many of you were kids, Vietnam was the example of international solidarity. Vietnam was the struggle against U.S. imperialism that many of us found tremendous inspiration from. And it wasn't just a military struggle, as Bernie said. It was a social revolution. Real, real relationships were going through dramatic changes. That inspired us. A generation later, it was South Africa that became the international focus for anti-imperialist um, uh, fighters and people who believed that empire was unjust, wrong, murderous, and so on. Today it's Palestine, and we have a responsibility to raise that at every turn, to say that, that we must unite with the Palestinian people in their right to self-determination. We were inspired by Cuba. We were inspired by South Africa. We were inspired by um, Guinea-Bissau and the little countries. In fact, we always said to ourselves, it's the little revolutions that are 
making us ecstatic, you know. It was Guinea-Bissau and Mozambique um, fighting against the Portuguese. It was funny because people, you know, used to yell at us in demonstrations at draft boards and stuff. I remember being out at, you know, 6 a.m. when the buses would pull up to the draft board in Chicago and trying to talk to the guys who were going in to step forward, always failing. I don't think anybody ever came said, oh, I'm going to go over with you guys and not step forward. But it was what we did regularly to kind of practice and try to talk ourselves into it. But that, that kind of activity didn't ever turn... The fact that we were resisting and, and in front of people every day made us better at thinking through the questions and thinking through the issues. And I, I feel like that that loop um, about mistakes and successes is very important because you don't know. How do you know? How do we know what we're building? We don't have advice for you and Unity. You're doing your own work. We're just here telling you about Chicago and you know talking about a book. You know, we, but I think it's important for you to feel that you know your situation, you know the people you're working with here, you're grounded in the work, and every step you take will lead you into a deeper grounding. This is going to be absolutely the last one. i got one person back here, I promise. I'm sorry, I know I missed some other people who had their hands up. Uh, we just can't get to it all. Say it loud. The time we had. Say it loud. I, I'm, just, I'm just going to say one more thing, and that is that um, I want to re-mention the donations here. The ten dollars you pay uh, and the, the, the support we have from the Sunni Bijangle Foundation don't cover the, the, the cost of bringing these guys here. So if you can help out anyway, it's not like we're in trouble or anything. I'm not saying that, but your generosity would certainly help. We got to keep this series going, bring back more speakers, uh, and, and 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 so before I, I take this last question, I just want to um, thank these folks yeah. for their generosity in coming. going to be offended. I do not have a question. I have a reflection. Okay. We're talking about small movements and those are the ones that tend to, to succeed. There was one small movement in this country which has succeeded, funded by the Koch brothers, known as the Tea Party. And that's how we got to the position that we are in today. If you have a chance, look up on the internet, Indivisible. They have a wonderful guide that's written by uh, some of the um, aides to congressmen um, as to how the conscious taught the Tea Partiers to change our government, to change our citizens' way of thinking. It's an excellent uh, article. Write to your congressman. Eh. They'll put a check mark on the paper. Email them. Eh, they'll put a check mark on the paper. Call them. Call them. Call them. One topic every call. Don't make it three or four topics. They have a greater impact than that letter or that email or that petition. They don't pay attention to those. Read indivisible. Learn how the Tea Party took over this country so we can take it back. And that's my reflection. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Yep, I'm, I'm giving it back to you. Orin Bill wants to answer about our relationship. Orin cut me off before I could say something about our relationship. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was a bummer. Um, but, you know, I mean, partly, I, all I really want to say is that, you know, I feel very lucky to have found a friend and a partner that I could be with for such a long time. But if, if we, I were giving advice to young people, I would say this, that, um, or, or old people, falling in love is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's a form of temporary madness where you lose your mind. But being in love for the long run also means finding a way to build a dialogue over a lifetime. And dialogue always involves listening with the possibility of being changed and speaking with the possibility of being heard. And dialogue is what makes friendships happen. It's not just uncritical acceptance, but it is kind of being um, honest with one another in a way that um, 
furthers the possibility of, of, of your relationship. So I think that that's, that's my advice. The other, the other piece I want to just end with is, you know, the great revolutionary Rosa Luxemburg, who's one of my favorite revolutionaries of all time, she was put in prison um, for her opposition to World War I. And while she was in prison, the movement that she was a leader of went through lots of stresses and strains and contradictions. She got a letter from a friend um, while she was in prison, and the friend said, oh, Rosa, we don't know what to do without your leadership. We're falling apart. We're going to hell. Please, we must get out of prison. And Luxembourg wrote back a letter that I think is a masterpiece. She started by saying, stop whining, which is good advice for the left at any moment. Stop <laughs> whining. It doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't take you where you need to go. So her first point was stop whining. And then her second point was, you need to find a way to be a mensch. M-E-N-S-C-H. If you don't speak Yiddish, you can Google it later. Um, she said, does not speak Yiddish. I do speak Yiddish. Mensch. There you are. <laughs> Boy. Um, but, but she said to her friend, you have to find a way to be a mensch. And then she said, I can't define mensch for you except to say that a mensch is someone who loves her own life enough to be able to enjoy the sunrise and the sunset, to have a bottle of wine and a good meal with friends, uh, to take care of the babies and the elders. But a mensch is some, also someone who loves the world enough to put her shoulder on history's wheel when history requires it. Work that out day to day, work that out week to week and month to month, and then you will be a mensch, and then you will demand the impossible, and you'll rise up yeah. both angry and in love. Thank you.